There are plenty of folks out there who are bad and members of my own family community who are paying way too much. Uh, we're not doing anything to change those cost dynamics. Right? But you still want to fight for that. But you want to keep what you have. You don't want to to take what you have. You don't want to like what you have. You like that. But you want to figure out a way to at least bring down the cost of health care. If you want that, to me, you can still have your fight and allow folks to act into Medicare. Give them a choice. Right now, Medicare is a high risk period. So everybody who's in it has to qualify. So the cost of administering it is going to be high because the folks who are, who are part of it are higher risk candidates. But if you give everybody the choice, healthy or otherwise, young or old, it'll, it'll, you'll have more money because more folks will opt in and it'll be a healthier pool of folks. And it'll keep the private insurance market the hope to a base floor now. Because right now the private insurance market can do whatever they want. Yes. If you have a Medicare component, which serves as the public floor, it'll drive down the premiums, it'll drive up the deductibles. And Medicare is already built in. See, the issue when you talk about a single payer system is there is no administrative reality for that. Because there is. But Medicare is built in. So if we can allow folks to opt in and still remain we still keep choice, um, that's a big deal. Um, what it also does if you're a small business owner and you have employees and you got to figure out how to get health care for your employees, right? If you have a public option, well, that takes a lot of overhead off your hands now because now they have more choices. And the, the reimbursement piece that you're talking about. Right? You have more, here's the thing though if you, have more, if you have more folks opting into Medicare, what does that mean? More folks buying in? That's more money. That's more money in the system. There's more money to administrate the system and to have reimbursement costs met. Right now, we're fighting for scraps. Right? Because we're fighting for scraps, we're in that position. So it's important that we. Women keep getting the tiniest scraps. No, and you're right. And, and, and that's what's so upsetting about John Fazio's vote, too, because he voted to take away funding for Planned Parenthood. Okay? And so we're talking about the scraps all around. And the people who can get hit the hardest on this are women. Not to mention women veterans. You know, uh, I'm going to tell you something. The, the, the suicide rate for women veterans about 250 times that of any other suicide. 250 times that. And the homeless rate, the homeless rate for among women veterans is the fastest growing homeless rate in any subset. So, so, so we're talking about resources for, for women with health care, whether it's Planned Parenthood, whether it's VA resources. We have to continue to get the short end of the stick. And it's the of continues to do wrong. By the way. You don't have to convince us not to vote for him. That's yeah, it's, important, it's important to make that contrast because everybody in this room is on that page. And everybody needs to hear that. Yeah, I understand. John Francis' projection was the reason that it took, that it cost to me $40 for a bottle of lotion to get rid of this poison ivy and stick it down when it was prescribed to me. Yeah, he's the reason. And that cost me $40 for a simple bottle of lotion to get rid of these rashes. So yes, I agree with your your idea to opt in to Medicare. Yeah, it's an opt-in. It's an opt-in. This is, the, this, is the, this is the unfortunate thing about our politics, is that the other side will take whatever they want and run with it and make up lies and mislead and you know, rather than just focusing on the facts. I think that's a, I, I think what I'm proposing, another piece that we have to make sure happens is Medicare needs to have negotiated power with Yeah. Yeah. That the biggest one of the biggest drivers of cost in our healthcare system. It doesn't have to be that we waste a lot. No, and the, and the reason why, when you think about what, where John Fazio gets his money from, it's on the lobby insurance. Yeah, exactly. So that's the law that's been written in the books that Medicare can't have negotiated power with Big Pharma. That's what this is if we, were to, if we were to give folks the choice to opt in that, and if we were to actually make sure that Medicare had negotiated power with Big Pharma, that would be a big step. It would be a big step to help deal with all the costs 
things in our health care. It, 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 it's, it's a significant step, and I think it's something that we can actually get done. I think that if, if we're able to take control back of the House, that's a step that we can do in a bipartisan fashion that can get it done. Are you optimistic about that? About like, what taking back the House? Taking back the House? I'm optimistic oh, yeah. that we're gonna that we can win this seat for sure. Um, I think it's you know I'm not in every district. I'm running here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and so I know that the energy here. I think good. people want change. I think people want change. I think they're tired of career politicians. I think they're tired of lobbyists. That's what I'm talking about. And, and keep in mind, Congressman before John Faso was Chris Gibson. Who is he? He's a Republican. I don't don't agree on a lot of issues. But he was a moderate. He was a moderate. And, and I've talked to Democrats well respected. Um, and I think, unlike John Faso, actually held public town halls. Unlike John Faso, actually had field offices all across the district. Unlike John Faso, actually posted his calendar on his website so that everybody could have access to him. And in some cases, he got in trouble because he extended himself so much. He went to um, uh, uh, the town hall. He got beat up on the town hall. They got on Rachel Maddow. And he took it. Because he said, okay, this, 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 this is the job. This is what's happening. This is what I got to do. That's the exact opposite. Just hiding. Just hiding. So I think people, I think people really are prepared for change. Uh, when we're talking about issues, real issues, not distractions, not lies. Are they overall that hip hop stuff? Are they still talking? No, they're gonna keep going there because they don't want to talk about the issues. By the way, you're so don't want to talk about. <laughs> they don't want to talk about health care. John Fassett does not want to talk about his broken promise to Andrew Mitchell. Doesn't want to do that. Does not want to talk about that vote to the, on the farm bill, where what? Forty percent of all the subsidies went to the three percent of the wealthiest farmers, corporate and mega farmers, none of whom live in our district. Doesn't want to talk about the fact that he actually advanced the tax code after he voted no. Yeah, not of folks know that. But that's what he did. So you know, he does not want to engage in any of that. So this is a distraction. This is what they do when they don't want to talk about the issues. But unfortunately for them, we are a disciplined group of folks. And I certainly am disciplined. And I will make sure that we stay day in and day out focusing on the things that people want to talk about, whether it's infrastructure, broadband access, cell service, health care, protecting our environment, real tax reform that puts more money in people's pockets, climate change, making sure young people aren't saddled with debt and have real opportunities for jobs. You know, they just gutted Pell Grant funding in the last budget. Over $200 billion they cut in the budget to pay for the tax breaks for wealthy folks. Well, they're, they're paying for tax breaks who are imprisoning children. Right. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. It's, it's unfortunate. The tent community. Yeah, it's, it's the tent community. It's, it's the camp, the summer camp. <laughs> but the fact is we can do we can do more. We can be better. Yes. And, and I, I think I think it's, it's not just about the issues, it's how we engage each other. I'm just tired of the lies. I'm tired of all the misleading. I'm tired of all the personal attacks. Like, can't we just talk about substance? We could disagree. We'll do it in an agreeable way. We could be civil. Hey, you agreed to debate now, right? And we'll see. We'll see how. We'll see how we. How we handle that? Let's see know, what he wants to talk about. But you know what? The <laughs> negative. The negative thing is what got him fired up. That's what got him fired up. Oh, good. That's he got interested. Excellent. Oh. There's something good yes. came out of it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Heard the commercial that was like, former rapper, not right for New York. And he was like, what do they mean by that? Like, why does it make him bad for New York? I'm like, well, <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah. But he already did. That's so smart. They weren't pulling up people in garage bands when they were younger. Yeah. No, they weren't. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and this, and like anyway, whether it's the First Amendment or it's the Second Amendment, they're not unlimited. They're not unlimited rights. You can't go higher. You can't get fired at you. Right? So it's not unlimited. Yeah. So it's important to try to write the balance. And what kills me is we have a congressman, once again, who's taken thousands of dollars from the NRA, who votes for the concealed carry reciprocity. Concealed carry. Who tells students, who tells students, you know, that it's a waste of valuable time to walk out in protest and draw attention to their concerns. You know, 97% of this country wanted to ban the bus stop. They wanted to do that after the race. So where was the bill for that? Where was the bill? I mean, yeah, where was it after Sandy Hook? Where was it after Parkland? Those are all votes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Should I? Should I? Should I? Should I go over to talk to the group? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, the whole group is here. <laughs> we should talk. So let me just.
First, thank everybody for coming. Unfortunately, I have to You have to go. All right. But it was a real pleasure talking to you, Mr. Delgado. Thank you. You're on a great case, sir. You too. God bless. So welcome, everybody. Uh, just so we're clear, this is a voter registration drive, right? We're here to register. And, and I want to talk to you about the importance of voting, particularly young people. Um, as I have uh, campaigned uh, across this district, um, what's become clear to me is that too many of the conversations that we're having in this con uh, conversation aren't about the future. They're not. All we're talking about is how to maintain the status quo. Uh, and we know that's broken. Whether it's the fact that we can't find good paying jobs for students who are graduating, whether it's the fact that we're saddling young people with debt, because of these intense interest rates that the government's profiting off of. Your desire to want to learn. Uh, whether it's a lack of real attempt to deal with the opioid epidemic in a meaningful way, or whether it's trying to really tackle climate change crisis. Uh, the fact of the matter is, a lot of folks understand that climate change crisis is a real thing. Very real. The science bears that out, the facts bear that out. Five years in a row, the hottest Temperatures on record, three decades in a row, the highest temperatures on record, extreme weather events becoming normal. And what are we doing about it? We're nothing doing nothing about it because we have folks right now in Congress and in DC who are bought and paid for by industries of yesteryear, fossil fuel industry, right? The folks who don't want us to move forward. Now, how do we change this though? That's in your hands. That's in the young people's hands, that's in the future's hands, to recognize that this is in your control. These policies are allowed to continue because they're banking on young people not voting. That's the reason why they think they can get away with this. It doesn't matter. We don't have to deal with climate change. We don't have to deal with debt, college debt. We don't got to talk about these things because even though they affect young people in a real way, they're not going to show up. They're not gonna show up. You're not gonna show up. That's what they're counting on. So think about it from a different perspective. What does that really mean? It means you got a lot of power. That's what it really means. It means if you actually vote, and you actually say, how do I get my friends to go out, register my friends, and find 10, 15 other folks, you actually do that work. The power is in your hands. It's really in your hands. Think about it. And so as we come to what, 32 days now before the election, 32 days, I, I, I want you to understand we are at a tipping point in this country where the level of inequality has reached staggering levels, staggering. 80% of folks are sharing just 10% of the wealth. 80% just 10% of the wealth. And since 2009, 95% of all the economic gains since the recovery have gone to the top 1%. And we get a tax bill that adds a trillion and a half dollars to our deficit. It just adds more and more debt. Who do you think that debt gets passed on to? Young people. And it gives you less choices with how to deal with climate change. It gives you less choices with how to deal with the opioid epidemic. It gives you less choices to how to deal with the healthcare crisis. When you pass debt on to that degree, it paralyzes our future. Why do you think after we pass the tax bill, we get, we have to cut Medicaid? Literally cut it by a trillion and a half dollars. It just did that. Cut SNAP, literally by a trillion dollars cut Medicare by 500 billion, and like I said, cut educational programs, Pell Grants by $200 billion. Cutting the future. Now the current congressman, if you go back and look a little Google search, you see him on a video saying, you know, we can't saddle our young folks with debt. We have $400 billion of debt. That was then, that was 2016, $400 billion of, of, of deficit, I should say. Now fast forward from 2016 to now, we're at 800 billion. Doubled. That doubled in less than two years. How is that fiscally responsible?
How is that fiscally conservative? How is that thinking about your future? And in the midst of all of this, deeper than just the policy, what's been happening to the culture of our politics? The civility, the decency, the respect for everybody's point of view. Let's talk about what happened today with the Capitol. Now, we have a situation where a woman came forward and by all accounts, credibly testified that the man who is the nominee for a lifetime permanent position on the highest court in the land sexually assaulted her. And by all accounts, it's credible testimony. Mr. Fazzo, before there was even a decision to investigate, said, let's confirm. Why? Why would we dismiss somebody's credible testimony? Other than we think this is all political theater and arena. It's all the partisan play. It's all Democrats versus Republicans. We're talking about a human being. <coughs> who's burying her soul. She doesn't get the respect, the decency, and the concern of her fellow Americans. And this is not a criminal investigation. This is not a trial here at the end of the day. This is a job application. So these things need to be explored thoroughly and seriously, putting aside Whatever, whatever differences I had with Kavanaugh's point of view on ideology and on politics, and putting aside that, just on the idea of some serious allegations being put forward, why is there a rush to politicize everything? Why is there a rush? And it gets to the heart of what's wrong with our political system. It's become a game for too many people. It's just a power grab for too many people. And really, it's not even too many people. It's too few people who have the resources and the money and the wealth and the capital to influence decisions at the vast majority of people's expense. That's a problem. That's a real problem. We have to change that. But the only way to change that, the only way to change that is to engage. That's it. People always say to me, well, how do you get money out of politics? Well, yes, we can try to overturn Citizens United. That's a big deal. But it's hard. It's very hard to do that. So how are we going to do it? Well, the one way we can do it is actually get engaged. You can't erase a vote. A dollar cannot erase a vote. So the more and more folks who show up and do the work, who truly want to inject real life into our political process and have true representation, the better. I see you with your hand up, sir. Um, I was going to ask again. Well, you can't vote for another nine years. So, so what can I do? Because yeah. I can't vote for another nine years. That's it? Yeah. Nine years? It's <laughs> <laughs> an excellent question. First of all, the fact that you're here is terrific. Huh? Um, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> it's important um, that you keep doing what you're doing, first of all. That's stay engaged from phone banking to knocking on doors. Just get out there and talk about how important it is for people to vote. You might not be able to vote, but you can tell somebody, hey, I need you to vote for me. I need you to do right by my future. Because if you don't vote person who can't vote right now, you're letting somebody else who might not be acting in my interest do something that's gonna harm my future. So help me, help me, because I can't do it right now. I'm counting on you to vote for me. So as you knock on doors, as you phone bank, that's how I would talk to folks. Make the case, say, hey man, I'm a good guy. I want a future, I want, a future. I want to go to good schools. I want to drink clean, uh, clean water and breathe clean air. I want to grow up and pursue whatever happiness I want to pursue freely not out of fear, you want those things, right? Yeah. So right now, you gotta count on some folks to get out there and vote. Particularly folks who share the same point of view. We wanna make sure you have those things. Because everybody deserves those things.
But at the end of the day, we all deserve an opportunity here. You know, no one's talking about a handout. Uh, handout. But we're living in a time right now where people are being pushed into the cracks. Pushed. That's bad. That's, 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 that's not even politics. That's just cruel. It's immoral. And there's a cynicism right now in our politics. It's a cynicism that it's all a game. None of it matters. It's just about power. People's lives are on the line here. Whether it's health care, whether it's how much money you can bring home and put food on your table, people are going hungry. Whether it's making sure that you have a future. So I, I, I encourage each of you to understand the stakes here. And understand how much power you really have. Because again, they're counting on you not to vote. That's what they're counting on. But if you just change that around, and say, no, no, we're going to vote this time. We're going to vote every time they're after. We're going to find 20 more people to vote with me. Go find them. Get them registered. Ask them, where are you going to vote? Where's your precinct? What's your plan? What time? You know? And if they want to volunteer, right? Well, they can sign up here. <laughs> Go to the website. Sign up there. There's an excitement that we gotta we gotta own right now. This should be a good time. Yes. To make sure you clarify the urgency about this, because there is a deadline for registration that's coming up. Yes, there is. Next week, right? Yes. yes, there is. The actual date. What is the actual date? Oh, oh, oh. October. <laughs> <laughs> I had so it's, far in the week. October 12th. It's the 17th if you're within county. So if you if you're if you live in Ulster County and you move and you just want to change your registration within county, it's the 17th. But for everybody else, if you're students from SUNY who want to vote here because this is where they live, it's the 12th. Yes. Post marker 12th. Yes. And, and and so time is is, is ticking. Time is ticking. Um, so let's get out there and, and get folks registered, and then get yourself a plan for voting. Put it on your refrigerator, put it somewhere. Memorize it and get ready. Yes? Uh, I have a question about um, something that you brought up a few times now is the idea that politics has turned into a game for a select few. Um, and I'd agree that generally, like Republicans in Congress have been making a little more power grabs um, and eroding several of the norms. It's not just Trump at the head of the uh, presidential branch, but um, Mitch McConnell has been eroding several of these norms as well. So I have identified as myself as like more of an Obama centrist Democrat, uh, two steps forward, one step back, but I'm not sure we can do a two steps forward, uh, like whatever 10,000 steps back that we're seeing right now. Um, so in your view for the Democratic Party, um, how, uh, how can we revitalize those norms? And are there any cases where uh, the rules of the game are outdated. Uh, Kavanaugh uh, getting confirmed, or uh, Merrick Garland not even getting a chance for a hearing. Uh, would you be open for, for example, like a position to pack the Supreme Court, or uh, which has been done before or something? Before? Well, there are a lot of informal rules right now that are simply unethical. Um, there's the Hassett rule right now in the House, which uh, basically means that. Uh, Republicans have decided they're not going to put a bill to the floor unless it has majority support within the Republican Party. Even if, even if a majority of the House, when you add up Democrats and Republicans, would pass the bill. Think about that. How's that democracy? So you're basically saying, we're not going to put anything to the floor, even though a majority of the House would pass because well, our party's majority wouldn't do it. We need to actually make that happen. We need to make that clear to folks and how absurd that is. Um, I think there's also, you know, uh, so like Republicans just now passed 50 votes per capita, right? They were able to do that because they did away with the filibuster. Okay? I don't know how it's appropriate to think that a lifetime appointment on the highest court in the land should be a completely partisan decision. It would seem to me that a far more appropriate way to make in that determination and to, set, to, to have some, some sort of guardrails to make sure that the ultimate outcome of this process 
um, is one that best serves the interest of everybody is to at least require some modicum of support from the other party. On some level, there's got to be 10, some, some number of votes to say, hey, it's not just a complete partisan vote to confirm a lifetime appointment position on the highest court in the land. But it's not just the dynamics that are going on in the informal sense of, of Congress, but it's also the systemic realities. When you're allowing state legislators to draw districts to their benefit, gerrymandering. And so we have literally incentivized extremism. Because if you get elected in certain districts, you think to yourself, well, I'm only scared of being primary. I don't got to worry about if I'm in a red district. I don't got to worry about the Democrat being because I got this thing covered if I'm a Republican in the red district. I got to worry just about somebody being more far right. And then similarly, if you live in a gerrymandered blue district, same dynamic. And so people run to the sidelines rather than figuring out how to come together. That's why I think we need to really implement a neutral arbor, independent commission to draw these districts. I think that'll go a long way in making sure that we can get to a point where systemically we're incentivizing bipartisanship and not leaving it into the hands of self-serving actors. It's human nature to want to hold on to your power. It's human nature to do things that preserve your status. It's the systems and the government's role to, uh, to, to, to check against that instinct, right? And right now, we don't have, we're not implementing those things in a meaningful way. In the same way we allow money to, over, uh, uh, to essentially undermine our democracy, unlimited amounts of money pouring into the system because the citizens united. And like I said, with only a handful of folks with money in this country now with access to capital, they're the ones who dictate the conversation. So getting money out of politics is very important. The revolving door of lobbyists. You serve and then go right to a lobby shop and make a nice, pretty dime. These are all the things that we have to be fighting for. Better governance, better ethical, principled governance that to me should transcend by partisanship. It should be about folks who are concerned about good government altogether. Do you believe that we should make it easier for people to be able to vote, such as making voting day a national holiday? Absolutely. Absolutely. It blows my mind that we fashion ourselves a sort of you know, the, the example of democracy. Right? We're the, the example in the world. That's, that's what we say. And yet, we do everything it seems, to undermine folks to engage. It blows my mind that we have election day on a weekday, a work day, number one. Particularly when you got folks who are working two, three jobs to get by, and they gotta worry about losing time, maybe losing their job. If they sit waiting in line for an hour or two hours just to vote, never mind the fact that they have kids. Where's childcare coming from? And these are the vast majority of Americans in this country. They just can't take off time whenever they feel like it and wait in the line for three hours to vote. So why does it make it so difficult? Then we've got voter ID laws popping up in certain states. And the only reason to do that is to disincentivize folks from getting out there and voting. So yes, I'm a big believer uh, in same day registration, early voting, any mechanism that allows people to vote easier, right, I think is permissible and should be pursued. If we're going to be the land of the free, the home of the free, if we're going to be about democracy in this country, then we ought to act like it. And that's another way to sort of check against all the money in politics. We have, I think, a, a better chance of passing these kind of laws than we do right now when we're turning Citizens United. So it's important to make sure that we, at the very least, are making sure everybody can vote. And, 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 and pushing them in that direction, making it easier and easier. And it's interesting because I don't know how if you're an American and you believe in democracy, you wouldn't want that. Unless, unless you believe that your point of view, your ideology, is not really the majority's point of view. And that you prefer to keep folks from coming to the polls because that's how your ideology, your point of view, can have legs, right? I want as many folks as possible to come out and vote in this election. I really want as many people to come out.
Because I believe if as many people come out, we're going to win. I don't believe John Fazzo wants that. I believe John Fazzo wants as many people as possible to stay home. I think that says a lot about our platforms, what we care about. Say, I often work 12 hour days, and if it wasn't for, I'm his nanny, if it wasn't for my flexibility with him, I wouldn't have been able to vote a couple weeks ago because the line was too long and I had to go get him off the bus, and luckily I'm able to bring him back and everything, but I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Right. No, it's, it's, it's that kind of flexibility that people need, and it shouldn't be uh, a luxury. It, yeah. it should be expected, it should be a baseline. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the right to vote, mm -hmm. it is the cornerstone of any democracy. That's it. When you start eroding people's ability to vote, you no longer have a democracy. Yes, uh, you've been talking a lot about the role money's playing in politics, which seems particularly relevant considering you're going up against an uh, incumbent candidate. So I'm just curious, like, what do you feel like your campaign's done in order to sort of overcome that, not even in an economic sense, but just all around the disadvantages of going up against an incumbent Yeah, candidate? and it's challenging. My opponent has taken $800,000 from corporate PACs. We pledge to not take over that money. Now, I will say that we are benefiting, my campaign is benefiting from running in a time where there is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. And people who don't typically give, who don't typically contribute to campaigns, who don't typically uh, go to rallies or go to you know, uh, political events, are doing that right now. So with the right organization and the right work ethic and determination, We've been able to raise a lot of money from individuals. Small dollar grassroots money, because we are actually reaching out, doing that work day in and day out. And there's a group of folks out there now who in years past may not have been engaged, but they are now. And so we, I think, are in a position uh, to raise good money from individuals, uh, not corporate PACs. But then at the same time, this is an important piece. No matter how much money we raise, even if it's competitive with John Fazio and the corporate PACs and all his allies. What we can do differently, and what we're banning is this, is the ground, is the field game, is contacting potential voters, people who have the ability to vote. They're not doing that. We're knocking on thousands of doors. We have field offices all across the district, Ulster County, Sullivan County, Seagull County, <clears throat> Columbia County, Green County. We have offices, real field offices, for folks to come and volunteer. We have regional field directors and organizers. We're there, everywhere. And we have a real system headed up by our field director, Christian, here. This is how we're going to win. It's making sure that we're knocking on the doors and we're getting people out. I don't think they're gonna work as hard as us in that regard. So that's the other way to sort of push back against whatever advantage they might have. Like I said, no amount of money can erase a vote. The body of the person is a person. And all we gotta do is make sure we get as many bodies as we possibly can to the polls. And if we do that, I can guarantee you we're gonna win. Got time for one more question. Do you support impeaching the president? <laughs> I support making sure that we put people in Congress who will see this investigation through. The fact that we have a special prosecutor who is conducting, a Republican special prosecutor, who is conducting an investigation that's led to over 30 indictments, plea agreements, convictions. Let's let this thing play out. I don't believe in rushing to judgment particularly in a country where we are founded on principles of due process. We are founded on principles uh, of fair play. Putting aside people's personal feelings about somebody, at the end of the day, you want something to conclude in the appropriate fashion so that whatever step is taken at the end of that process, it has merit, it has justification, and it comes across as valid as opposed to biased based. We've got to maintain that sense of neutrality, that impartiality. You know, the, the Lady Justice, she's, she's blindfolded at the end of the day. She's blindfolded for a reason. You know, the idea is to be, remove your subjectivity. 
root what you might want or not want, but just focus on facts that the facts bear out. That's why it's problematic for me that we can't have a Congress right now step up to the plate and protect Mueller. At the very least, what you should want to do is make sure that Bob Mueller is not fired unreasonably by the executive branch. But we can't get that. We can't get bipartisan legislation to protect him. John Fazer won't commit to it. At the same time, John Fazer will say, you know, I think the investigation is appropriate, but I understand the impatience people have with the length of the investigation. I disagree. What's there to understand about the length that's impatient? It's proven to be quite fruitful. It's bearing a lot of evidence. Let it see its way through and make sure that we're in a position to act appropriately at the conclusion. Uh, so um, I am not one of those people who thinks we have to do something now. I think it's, it's imperative that we let this thing play out and we'll decide based on the facts. Facts still matter in my world. Okay, I don't believe in alternative facts. I believe in facts. Um, and so I want facts. Let's let the facts play out. <laughs> this up and thank everybody for coming. Uh, I really appreciate the time and the energy and I really hope if you take anything away from this conversation, anything, take away that the power is in your hands. It's in your hands. As I said repeatedly now, they're counting on you not to vote. That's the equation, not to vote. So you can just vote. Just vote and change everything. Just vote and change everything. <laughs> Charger right here, tell him where. Oh, sorry, it's all right. Thank 